welcome to Josh's House of Nerd podcast. Hello, Nerd Nation. I'm Josh, and I welcome you to the podcast. Grab a cold evergreen goblet of blue milk and make yourself comfortable here at my House of Nerd. Now for tonight's sponsor. When you think of a perfect meal, what do you think of? Do you think of a nice steak or maybe some lobster? Well, don't lose your head looking for the best meal on the planet. You have now found it with Bob's cow head meat on a stick. It's an amazing aroma of raw meat mixed with a smell of a dumpster that will keep you coming back for more head. This meal is so good. It's been rated the number one meal in District 9 for the last decade. Come on down and get some head. Come on and get some head at Bob's Cowhead Meat on a Stick while supplies last. Not a sponsor. Wow. You're demonetized now. <laughs> yeah. What? They're talking about it's talking about getting some cowhead, man. Yeah, that's not I'm not sure that's better. <laughs> and it has that great raw meat smell of dumpster and wow. raw meat. Who doesn't like that, dude? Come on. I told you there was a couple of little tongue twisters in there. My goodness. That last right. part I never could get right. Come and get some head at Bob's cow head meat yeah. on a stick. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to repeat it. it was no, disturbing I want to, the first actually. time. <laughs> I knew I was going to screw it up. All right. <laughs> All right. On the podcast today, we have Crit and John, and we are talking about a movie which is part of our topic of June, which is utopian or dystopian movies. And this week we're talking about Crit's Pick, the 2009 movie District 9 from director Neil Blomkamp, who has done many other movies that you might have heard of, uh, namely Chappie and Elysium. One I have seen, one I haven't seen. Uh, this movie is about an extraterrestrial time. race forced to live in slum-like conditions on Earth who finds a kindred spirit in a government agent exposed to their biotechnology, starring Shirley Copley, David James, and Jason Cope. Let's talk about that movie, guys. I, I find it interesting. Um, I didn't know this, that um, all of the prawns in this movie mm -hmm. uh, were done by Jason Cope. Yeah. And Crazy so enough. I didn't know that until I started doing a little bit of research on the movie. Yeah, and I stuff. Mean uh blown kind of especially since this was kind of his debut he's known as how to like get amazing looking sci-fi out of lower budgets i think yeah like, i thought he had a reputation for that so yeah Did, would yeah. you consider uh elysium being kind of lower budget uh even though it had like matt damon in it and things like that no it, it isn't lower budget i don't think um it's what happens when you're somewhat successful and then you get a bigger budget. Yeah. Which, which I think uh, district nine is a bit better than Elysium. I would say. I, I, I no, agree I agree with, with you. Uh, and I mean, Elysium has some great action scenes in it, but I think as an overall story, district nine is better. I, I absolutely agree. And, and especially considering that if we're looking at the budget, district nine's budget was estimated at 30 million. Elysium's mm -hmm. was 115 estimated. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, that, that, that's kind of that's a hard. I mean, like, like you said, I, I I think we see a lot of debut directors come back with their second film where they have more money and sometimes just doesn't capture the same magic their first debut one did. You know, the same power it had, and I think that's that's exactly the same with Elysium and District Nine. I think the 9. special effects in Elysium was pretty good. Like once they hit like up in space, but it was still kind of the CGI was still a little rough. Whereas I felt like even though this had a lower budget. I felt like the CGI for the most part was pretty tight. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I still think knowing that it was $30 well. million dollars he had to work with. Yeah. I mean, what? You know, what? 11 years later? Still pretty good. Yeah. No, it holds up fantastically well, I think. I mean, and, the, and the I think it's positing. Yeah, right. and I think it's because they, to me, I think they used a lot of practical effects when they possibly could. Mm -hmm. and you know lowered the cgi bill and then made it stand up more the test of time i mean higher higher practical effects generally stand up better um and i i don't think that's a i don't think that i think that holds true for district nine as well i mean yeah. a lot of movies do that to try to save those bucks like i was watching a a documentary um about uh the um flight of the navigator 
and how, you know, that was some of the very first CGI, which was very expensive at the time, but they used a lot of the shots of the ship, believe it or not. You, a lot of people thought they were CGI and it's actually not. It's actually a practical, uh, uh, practical ship that they've just hidden the cranes on mm-hmm. in many, many, many shots. And, and that's where you'd kind of, you, when you find that great blend of CGI, because sometimes you can't tell and sometimes you can't, uh, most of the time you can't tell. And the better movies is when they're using practical and you can't tell necessarily where they're putting the CGI. And it also saves on budget too. Yeah, I think it comes down to like, um, I, I wonder, I've always wondered when I watched District 9, if knowing that they were going to put so many uh, aliens in, and not aliens in the Star Trek type way where it's basically just a, above the neck for the most part um like they're gonna put so much of the cgi in for the aliens that they're like well we're just gonna blow the entire budget you know on putting aliens in so for everything else we'll go practical and the interesting thing is like it takes so much upfront effort i think that's why a lot of you know uh, maybe lesser movies that are CGI kind of, and you can kind of tell, you know, it's, it's just really after the fact is it takes so much effort to plan a practical approach to uh, effects than it does like for, at least for the director, you mm-hmm. know, and, and the on-site crew and stuff like that is if they're all just like, Oh, we'll just CGI this here and we'll CGI this there and we'll CGI this here. You know, they're just like basically betting that the CGI that, happens you know after production or post-production uh you know shooting of the film and stuff like that will be good enough whereas then if you're if you take all that debt up front for the movie and create a bunch of practical effects right like that's very very difficult very time consuming for the production crew but you know what you have because it's on film like it's not a guesswork uh, later to be like, oh, we'll, mm-hmm. we'll get this stuff uh, put in later. And then we're talking about like, you know, highly upfront CGI, like the aliens removing cranes and stuff like that is still CGI. It's, it's composite work. It's, it's a lot of, um, yeah, that's now, what it was. It was, of, it was composite work of mats yeah. and stuff like that in the last start. It's at least visual sorry. effects. Yeah. 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 Flight of the navigator to do that. Yeah. 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 So it's like, you know, it, it's, it's weird. It's like the, it's like, if you don't know, like, if you, you're just like, okay, we'll just CGI and all this stuff later, there's a really good chance, unless you are super meticulous, uh, you know, Peter Jackson level meticulous with the, with that type of stuff. Or even, I would say, uh, Lucas meticulous. You know, he's, you know, definitely did a whole lot of CGI, you know, full sets and everything else. But for the most part, it works because he's, he's basically trying to make, he's not, He's not waving his hand and saying, oh, we'll figure this out later. He's already got it figured out. He just knows that he's going to film it in a certain way. And then, then, you know, he knows what the CGI is going to go into it. So he's already done that pre-production work. Mm -hmm. Uh, Almost probably, I would say, equivalent to the pre-production work necessary to do practical. Yeah. Well, you look Uh, at James Cameron and when he did Avatar, uh, what was it? Something like five years that he took to uh, play with that technology to get it good enough to be on screen. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think that's as that's as rougher rougher than any other kind of practical, and yet I mean those, for the most part, all of that looks amazing. Well, I mean, you you look at one of my favorite movies ever, Mad Max Fury Road, oh, yeah. and George Miller. I mean, they had seven years of drawings for their CGI work that they were going to do. Like they knew, and they did a ton of practical stuff. But they also did probably almost equal amounts uh, computer uh, animations. And, and it's probably and some of the most artistically done, most amazing blending I've ever seen between a CGI set and a practical set. I mean, that's that's like master level stuff right there. Right. And it's like, but that's the whole point. It's like they, they spent so much pre-production work on it uh, to get it, to know exactly what they were going to do so that when they're actually on set, they're doing a bunch of practical effects too, but they know already how it's going to, uh, you know, how it's going to work. They've already got, yeah. they've already done their homework and it feels like some lots of lesser shows and movies. It's like, okay, we kind of know where we want the characters to be. And so we're going to film them and then we'll just fill in the background and, and fill in the effects and, you know, and that type of stuff. And you're just like, 
well, this sucks. It doesn't. It's not convincing. It's way. Do you in feel the like he did his Valley. homework on this movie, this District Nine, when it yeah, comes to I, that stuff? I, I feel like since it's it's his premiere, mm-hmm. and he was already already based off of his own short film. Yep. Um, he knew Which, kind of where what he wanted to do, and how to. He already knew how to do the techniques possible. So, in some sense, he did some of the homework in the previous short film, and then did mm-hmm. basically expanded it and did a you know with a higher with a much, much higher budget. Absolutely. No, I, I would agree with you. Matter of fact, I was kind of looking at the faces. I've seen this movie enough that I could really, this might be my fourth or fifth watching of this movie. Mm. And it was enough that I could, I actually knew that I could, um, I started looking at kind of the textures of the face of, of the prawns and, mm-hmm. and something like that. And, and I was blown away on how highly, uh, thought out even just the, the movement of the faces was and um, yeah, the details yeah yeah, yeah you spent... know and that's on on the small budget that it had I, I'm still just it just still blows my mind and even back in 2009 when I first saw the movie I mean it, it was just absolutely blowing my mind even that because everybody was it was being promoted as it, when, you, when you talk to a lot of people it was being promoted like can you believe that like this was done for just this low amount of money and how good it looks. I remember having talks about that at my last job. Yeah. It's, it's an amazing process because I mean, not only that, but they used the, you know, the, the camera wasn't blocked off. It had a lot of, you know, kind of rack pulls and stuff like that and refocusing and, and really kind of use the camera as, you know, part of the storytelling as opposed to mm-hmm. just kind of setting it and, and then, you know, blocking everything off and stuff like that, which is cool because it, it helped, it probably helped cover a lot of that, you know, 2000, probably 2007, knowing how long it takes to do the production of the show, of the movie, you know, probably 2007, 2008 era CGI. Yeah. You know, you bring up the, the like the shots when they're going out there and they're talking and stuff. Um, I think a lot of, you know, that documentary style, I guess, I think in many ways helps them with the kind of the, not only just the, maybe the CGI, but the grittiness and, I mean, I think it helps helps on a whole bunch of different levels of them, you know, kind of that, what is that, that a found footage style, found footage style. Yeah. I just, yeah. the words couldn't didn't I, I'm come not to my a mind. Big found footage style person. Like, I'm not either. Generally like it. And they actually broke the found footage style rules in this movie multiple times. How so? Uh, well, where the helicopter had, shot. Yeah. Well, not just the helicopter shot, yeah. but also there's shots of. Like they have this, they set up this premise of like found footage, not really found footage, documentary. It was more documentary, you know. I felt. Yeah, 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 documentary style, and it's like over the course of the movie, the movie just forgot that it was doing a documentary style until the very end when it was doing the post uh, story <laughs> uh, setup and stuff like that. And it's like they they basically used it to kind of get your attention and and kind of you know ground the audience in the world. It's like, oh, this is you know this kind of looks like a, a news report or something you'd maybe see on 2020 back in the day or something like that. You know, it's like you would, uh, you know, th- they did that, but then they kind of forgot about it. And they had shots where like, you know, the little was boy was low. down in the spaceship. Yeah. Or... It's down low on the ground. And it's like, uh-huh. nobody, you know, nobody got down there and did that. And, and <laughs> it's weird how it cut back and forth. It's very inconsistent. And I would say like, but... you know, a better, uh, a, 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 like a level up to the movie, like to make the movie just even better would be somehow to figure out how to do this story with, you know, kind of either abandon the the documentary style together or try to keep it all documentary style. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if it would have worked because I think for an ent- entertainment sake, I like the fact that it just kind of broke out of the documentary style. Yeah. I, 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 I can see it like maybe needing some work on the transitions and not trying to, you know, being okay with its own self breaking out of it, but I was yeah, okay right. with the fact it broke out of it because it it felt like a you know we're we're like you said it's a, it's a hook it brings you in, and then it turns into something entirely new. And I love being kind of like surprised like that or changed where you you think you're getting one thing and then suddenly it kind of morphs into something different. So I'm okay the movie did that, but like you said, I, I think some you. some help on the transitions or just the movie being okay with itself, you know, throwing away you know, the beginning part with the documentary, like using it as the hook, making the transition and not really worrying about having to go back to it. Right. Let right. me ask you guys this question really fast. Why I'm thinking we're on the documentary style thing. Um, I just read that article and you guys might've too, that he said just a few months ago that they're working on district 10 and 
do you think that this in this day and age that the found footage that you know way that he shot this would work again if he put out a, a sequel in the same fashion what what are your guys' thoughts on that you mm, think it would I'm not because you don't see it as much I don't anymore think as a found footage coming i mean i i don't know that i'd want a sequel to this i'd like the open ending I, you don't I want don't... to see when Vickis get get getting fixed when he comes back in three years. I mean, nope. Okay. Yeah, I I Fair enough. don't like if they want to make a sequel, make a sequel because if we get a good movie out of it, then wonderful, right? As like, long as we I, don't I get don't... Independence Day resurgence, that's all. I, well, that's all. Well, I'm no, sure. if they get a bad movie out of it, we just don't go see it. Like there's no loss on our part, even if they put out a bad movie. Good call. Right? I mean, it, but the potential I, of getting a good one, why not? Yeah, try? yeah. If, yeah. if they're gonna if they're gonna drop you know millions of dollars on making a, a sequel, and everyone wants to do it, okay, go do it. Like if if it comes out terrible, you know, then it's terrible, and we don't have to watch it, and it doesn't ruin the ending. I I, I guess I'm just not of the opinion that a bad sequel ruins a good uh, previous movie. Yeah, no, like, I. I, I agree with you there. I, I you make the choice of how much you you change in your head, and then yeah, I just I don't I don't necessarily see the need. Like I'm I'm fine exploring different things. I I personally I the like either, the actually. open ending. I like okay. the you know what could happen. You know I I, I like that. I, I, mean, I don't feel I, like gypped. Yeah, I, if they were gonna do a, if I was gonna do a second movie, which I won't. I'm not a movie maker. Nobody's gonna give me millions of dollars to do this. Uh, <laughs> I would want to tell a different story in the same universe. Like don't come back to the guy, like make that a background element and some other, tell a different story, right? And tell a different story with different characters, have some nods to the previous movie, uh, certain events happening or something like that, or even, you know, do some really cool ending where like your story ties into either the beginning of this story, which would kind of be neat. Or I think that would be cool. Uh, your story ends up at the same place as you know uh, Christopher coming back. Yeah, you know, I'm okay with that. Kind theater. of like an anthology like, style. Yeah, yeah. Don't use it. The universe is interesting. It's got an interesting setup. Um, it's got interesting ideas in it. it you can, it's sci-fi. You can explore this. You could you could talk about, you know. Uh, I think this was you know kind of an immigrant story and a and a exploitation story. Uh, you could do, you know, an ecological story or... Well, he based you know. this off of an actual action. Did you guys read about that? No. There was an actual action that was... This is built off. This is why it's called District 9. Actually, this exact same thing happened in um, back... Uh, I think it was in the 90s during apartheid, mm -hmm. uh, where they cleared out an entire... It was called District 6, and they cleared out an entire uh, black community... Um, to just plow the slum over uh, just to make uh, room for uh, a yeah. richer white neighborhood. Yeah, and that makes sense. I mean, that's that's what the movie's going for. That's what sci-fi is good at, is, is uh, expanding the story, basically sneaking in real-world events or real-world concerns into a fantastical story to get the audience thinking about these types of things, like how unfair it is, you know, um, although like <laughs> the, the prawns for the most part were very much, you know, not like if you're, if you're saying that it, it's a, uh, this, this would be my criticism of like the plot, right? Okay. I don't know if we want to get into that yet. No, that's fine. Um, but cool. like if you're, if you're sitting down and going, okay, this is based on, you know, a real event, let's say district six and stuff like that then you have to start thinking about, well, how are the prawns represented in the movie, right? Like, uh, like the majority of them mm -hmm. are represented as not very high in intelligence, very dirty and messy, also extremely violent or prone to violence. Uh, difficult to understand. Like you only have the protagonist uh, prawn and, 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 you know, his kid and, and maybe uh, his friend that gets killed mm -hmm. early on as examples of like, but I mean, you still, if you're painting the picture of like, you know, this is terrible and stuff like that, you're also not giving any dignity to the prawns themselves. And they're supposed to be a representation for the black people that were moved into district city. Like that's not a great representation. Like that doesn't give any dignity to them. I'm not sure if it was a direct interpretation of it. It's just the more of well, the basis. I mean, if they're still, basing it on it. I mean, it's, it's still, yeah, I think it's a, a very valid criticism. 
but no, yeah, I, you, yeah, I agree. Yeah, uh, if you're trying to if you're trying to give if you're trying to use sci-fi to let people empathize with something that they would not empathize with, so the whole idea is that you know uh, your average audience wouldn't empathize with or wouldn't empathize as much with a um, a group of people being uh, a group of human beings being put upon in this way. Like we, it's not fantastical enough. It wouldn't really get our attention. That's the evening news, right? So you put it in, you replace them with aliens and then you build your whole story around the same premise. Well, then the representation, how you show the aliens and what they are can, will be interpreted as how those people are. You, you know? know, you know, talking about this, I didn't really think about this until just right now, but this is a really in that way that you're talking about it, uh, describing that really has some alienation kind of throwback vibes. Oh, yeah. I, I think alienation might actually be a better plot. <laughs> uh, no, I it, agree. I think it was better executed too. Uh, maybe. I don't know about better executed. In, 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 the, in that line of the this. story. Yeah. Maybe on that line of story because yeah. there the, the dignity really does rest, you know, uh, with the aliens. Um, you know, it, it is a true, like, allegory for racism um where you know the, the all of the fears are un, are you know 90 percent unfounded whereas in, oh, in yeah. this movie district nine i don't know that 90 percent of the fears are unfounded i mean there's a i mean something i guess you could have a longer conversation about you know nature versus nurture that they were stuck you know they are basically or at least theorized to be workers for the on this ship they had nothing you know they were living in filth and and everything else like that and pulling them out and putting them into a place is going to create a slum and then when you surround them with walls like there's no room for dignity in that situation well and then at the same time like you, you have it you have to think about it they are literally alien so their definitions of cleanliness and sloviness and what you know is actually slob or to them is can be drastically different what's i mean what it is to us i mean this might be very common for them i mean they were saying that they were malnourished i don't know like do you believe the documentary stuff at the beginning because it's yeah suspect yeah but they were you know they were said to be malnourished and you would think that you know a happy uh ecosystem wouldn't have its you know inhabitants be malnourished but whatever you know it's certainly possible but again you know as much as we can kind of couch any representation in the alienness of the subjects it's still a sci-fi story for humans about Mm -hmm. human situations Mm -hmm. you know and so in some sense i don't know yeah no i'm I'm just i'm i'm making a point that the movie doesn't could have been to make I'm yeah, just, yeah. you know, in, in a real situation, like what, what, and, and you could, you could take this out to other people too, because people can live in different situations and not feel like that's a real big issue. You can live in sure. slum housing because they don't put any value on housing other than a place to sleep. Like, so check this one possible. out too, guys. Um, during the filming of this movie, I also found out when I found out about district six is, you know how they were moving people out of the slum here? Um, and into government housing, you know, that, uh, the aliens into government housing, Mm -hmm. they literally use, they were doing the same thing in this slum that they were using as district nine in the movie at the exact same time they were filming the movie. Mm -hmm. They they were basically moving. And in some cases, forcibly moving, uh, people, um, uh, that had settled in that slum. It sounded like a, they never said if it was one race or another or another. They just said they were moving everybody from that slump into government built housing. And all of those um, shacks were real shacks, except for the one where, uh, of course, that is, um, uh, is it Christopher? Mm-hmm. What, yeah. Uh, his friend where they had this ship overneath it, overhead of it. Um, Every, all the rest yeah. of them were actually houses that had just not like within like, a week or so had been um, people had lived there and they just were reusing them for the movie. I thought that to be kind of interesting as well. Yeah. Cause so kind of a, it was almost like mirroring in the movie exactly what is, what was happening at the exact time the movie was happening too. Yeah. Just, just interesting. Yeah. And I think good, good sci-fi attempts to, you know, reflect 
our human problems to the ourselves. Best sci-fi just through a reflects our human problems. Yeah, yeah, and and I think District Nine, you know, maybe does that clumsily a little bit, but it certainly is entertaining, and and uh, it does a good job at being a good movie for sure. One thing that kind of bothered me a little bit, and I'm trying to contemplate like if this was intentional or not of, you know, you guys talked about when they went, first went up to the ship and they went in there, you know, had been up there for like three months and they kind of broke through and went in there and they saw them and they, they thought they were living in poverty and, you know, their own filth and all that stuff. But when, when the, the main alien, um, when Christopher, like he, um, he get, finally gets the fluid and he's, you know, going up to the ship, he seems like, it's pretty easy for him to get that ship going. So makes you wonder, okay, why did they see that stay there for so long doing nothing above the city when it seemed like he was able to uh, put it together with scraps of his own technology and, and make his way home. You know, it, I don't know if that's a plot hole or, or what, because it seemed like at the beginning, it's like they are stuck. And then now he almost, 20 years later, now he was able to assemble this enough to leave. Yeah. I, I don't think it's a, I wouldn't say it's a plot hole because it's okay. not something they, they, ex, they kind of bring up and then it just gets dropped really. Um, I think it's more along the lines of the movie chose not to explain that part because it either didn't have an explanation or didn't want to explain it. Right. It's like, fair enough. There's only so many stories to tell. And that wasn't, you know, that's a, that's something that gets you thinking about that universe. Like what are the complications? Why did it take 20 years? Why do you have to collect all these fluids from, you know, Kron technology from the ship? Why couldn't you know? he be just flown a helicopter up to the ship if it was that way? Or, you know, I mean, well, these are all the things that kind of okay. come across my mind. And they did, and they did address that a little bit because they, they, you know, they talked about the, that thing that was buried underneath their hut. They all saw, you know, they had film of that falling from the ship. Yeah. Right. Yeah, they and did. it's like, uh, and there's no, there's no clear story about, you know, what happened on that ship to cause it to be where it is, you know? And so, like I said, it, it's, a, there has to be room for like intriguing avenues that are unexplored in a story that has an interesting, like, I think more interesting nuanced story set up, like, uh, not story set up, but, uh, let's say, um, Maybe something that you don't know Hot all setup. the yeah you, everything that why does that work why does well you look at um well it's like a D and D campaign where you chose to go left instead of right like down the right path could have been a really interesting story but you just didn't choose to go that direction you went down the left path and that's the story you have that feels more right to me than everything is tied up in a nice but that's how you get like opening monologues and and. Uh, crawling text and stuff like that to try to explain everything about the movie. And I think, I think there's something to be said about like leaving, like the reason these types of stories stay in my mind is because they do leave them open. They don't answer all the questions. Well, think about, I don't need everything. The expanse. Yeah. They don't explain everything in the expanse. And that's, and I think that's great because you don't need anything. They only explain enough to help you along with the plot. It doesn't, you don't have to know everything. Right. You know, same thing. And I think it makes it more intriguing. Yeah. You know, even though I think it makes it more intriguing, sometimes I still like my weird mind thinks these things. <laughs> no, it, it, and you're supposed to. No, it's not weird. That's the whole point <laughs> of having a more interesting uh, environment to tell the story in is that there's lots of stories you could tell. That's why I'm saying like if they come up with a District 10, I'd want it to be a different story in the same environment because there's lots of avenues they could go down. That's different from the one they chose to down, go down on this movie. And the reason why that's interesting is because they left it open like that. Not because they tried to answer all the questions. So what do you think the, here I'm asking all the questions. These are the questions that have come up. Yeah. You you know, and one of the questions that came up when I was thinking about that is (laughs) why, and why they chose Vickis. You know, why, what was, you know, what was his purpose in this, why they chose that path for him to kind of walk down to, you know, start turning into one of them. They didn't, I mean, they didn't choose that for Vickis. It was a complete accident that Vickis started churn, turning. No, no, I'm not saying, I'm talking about the movie creators themselves. What was their, the writers, why you think that, uh, 
what was their thinking when they made him th- start to slowly become one of them. This is a really good actor. <laughs> we we need some people to might call you conflict. questionable on that one, but <laughs> I don't think no, so. it was it was conflict. I think, I think he's, he's great. Actor. I've heard some bad things talked about in the press about him, but I don't I don't know. I don't I think like it's unbiased. him personally or him on the set him, or him personally. Oh well, I don't. In we had this, like uh, his yeah. acting, yeah, we've not had himself. This conversation. Yeah. I, I don't care if he's a monster in real life because I don't know that to be true. No, no, no. I don't, it's nothing about him personally in the real life. Like he did something wrong. Just more of like the way that he acts. Yeah, a lot of people have poo pooed him a little bit. Yeah, out there in the editorial world. I remember this. Oh, one they think his acting about, is like, bad. Yes, like in, okay. when he was in Chappie and when he was in a uh, because he's been in almost every one of these movies. Well, I mean, how much is him and how much is the writing that's given to him? And I will, I will agree with I don't that because the, I, in, I don't think the writing is very good in Chappie or Elysium. No, it's not. And he's in, he's in both of them. And I don't think it's that great either. And I, I actually think that I, I, when I saw these things in the, in the press, I was just like, I don't think that's very fair because I think he does a fantastic job. And it makes me think that he did even more of a job when I read what I read today, that almost all the stuff that he did, like when he, they were out and about was ad-libbed. Yeah. I was I was actually floored when I found out that him and the other guy that, that did the bugs, did the prawns, um, that that was all ad lib because it felt very fluid. I felt like it was like very well done. Well scripted. In, yeah, I thought it was scripted. I really did. And when I found it was ad libbed, I was kind of blown away a little bit because that just proves me on how a, a depth of an actor he is. And it's funny because he didn't even want to be an actor. He wasn't hmm. really an actor before this movie. Um, he just did this. He kind of got pulled into the short story that was District Nine, you know, the short story of District Nine before this movie, and it kind of went from there. It was just kind of an accident, really. And yet, I think he does a great job, and he shows his chops. Um, yeah. In ad libbing, because that's one of the hardest ways to act, in my opinion. Uh, maybe. I mean, I don't, I don't. I don't know. None of us are actors, so we don't know. I mean, if you're trained in, um, you know, kind of ad lib, and that's kind of your wheelhouse maybe it's not that difficult you know um but if someone's not that's you know sometimes if if someone's not and then they turn out to be good at it well yeah Yeah. that's that's probably really difficult exactly Um, yeah uh i don't know i i have a problem with the main character um and kind of how you know it's interesting that you bring them up like what is what are the writers trying to do by having him transition you Mm -hmm. know and the yeah, it was a thought that like, came up. What was, yeah. why did we walk this path with him? Again, it's a, it feels muddled to me because, okay. uh, he is essentially our protagonist, I think. Um, and there is like, if you identify with him at the, you know, if you empathize with him at the beginning of the movie, you have some really like, like he was a klutz. He was, you know, even his mother's calling him below average, you know, intelligence. Uh, I mean, he was a terrible person. I mean, the whole part where they're burning the eggs and stuff like that. And he's like, you're the popping. Yeah, that popping. You know, and it's like, you know, it's he he's not a good person in any sense. Like, you don't want to be him. You don't want to be friends with him. You don't want to even be around him, really. And most people acted like he didn't want they want to be friends. Yeah, like he's like a pest. Yeah, he's kind of a and the way he acts, he's kind of a piece of crap you know, as as an actual person, you know, there's no empathy in him at the beginning of the movie. Right. And zero. And to have him like transition to the point, like it's, it's weird because you can't put the audience probably can't put themselves in his place and then empathize with him as he's having this, you know, uh, change in (laughs) species, (laughs) uh, you know, which is, I mean, is that supposed to be a metaphor for like, you know, becoming the oppressed when you were the oppressor? I don't know. I mean, that, that's the hard part about it. It's like, cause it's hard for the, I would think it's hard for the audience to insert themselves in order to empathize with the main character as they're going through this transition. But at the same time, maybe that's a redemption thing, but it felt like it just kind of flipped really quickly. Right. I feel like it flipped really quickly. And, and my thoughts were similar to what you're saying is I was always thinking that maybe they wanted him to empathize with the other people that he was seeing. He was being a part of the, of the tragedy going on. A well, it's part like a racist of racist getting its comeuppance, you know? Right. Because he becomes the thing that he despises. 
Yeah. Okay, fine. But like, and then he becomes a tragic heroic character at the end. It's, it's, it's weird because it doesn't feel like there was enough time for that type of transition to really like sit with the audience. Okay. Like it's like, you know, I don't, like I said, it just feels muddled to me. It doesn't feel crystal clear about what they were trying to say, you know, at, at, with their, with their story, which is fine. Again, like I said before, I think it's actually a great I, movie and it does a great job. Being I, I, I got a, I got a little bit of that. Uh, some of it, I think for me, I didn't have quite the jarring change simply because I, I chalked it up to, um, um, and, uh, I just blanked on his stupid freaking name. Um, like Vicus or yeah, Vicus. Sorry, I blanked on his name completely. Um, okay. I I chalked it up to to Wickus being um the fact that it's his dad, like it, his dad is his executive, or sorry, his his father in law is this executive, and he's kind of being, you know, like he said, he he grew up low average intelligence according to his mom. He's like he's just been beaten down his whole life, and he's you know expected to act and be a certain person, and so I think maybe the the transition wasn't as harsh to me because I treated his beginning as this is the person he feels like everyone's expecting him to be. And so he's going to be that person. This is the person he's pushed into the role he's pushed into. And towards the end of the film, maybe we see a little bit more of like who he actually is if he stood up and, you know, had his own life and had his own, own stuff. And I could be absolutely wrong about that. He could be a, a complete dick and we just didn't find that transition. And that transition was, was struggle, but that's kind of wh- why it didn't, I don't think I struggled with that as much. Okay. That's an, that's an interesting take. I mean, I never got the, the sense that he was performing. Maybe that, maybe that was their intention is that early in the movie he was performing. Cause like he's <laughs> regardless of whether he was confident or not, he was a guy with power over other people. Yeah at the very beginning of the movie. So it's not like he was beaten down from a societal standpoint, like people didn't like him and maybe he wanted to be liked more. And I could see that contributing to his, you know, I think this is what people think I should act like, you know? And so he acts like a dick because he thinks that's what people, but that still doesn't necessarily, you know, like he's taking enjoyment. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm not saying that, 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 that yeah. exonerates him in any way, shape or form. No, like, it, it, you're still and a dick. <laughs> yeah, it, it's certainly possible that maybe that's what they were going for. I don't. I didn't really see that myself, but it's it, yeah. I could see how, you know, with some slight tweaks to the script or or you know maybe the performance or something like that, there are ways to to get that across. Maybe they just couldn't find that, or it, maybe it got lost in the midst of everything else. Right? It's like they've got a lot they were trying to do with this movie, and you know the nuances of you know Vickis's you know. Uh, outward performance versus inner life uh, wasn't really one of the things on the, that they, you know, could really get to. Mm-mm. Yeah. That's interesting. That was a good question though. <laughs> no, it just makes me, you know, sometimes I just, I think like that, you know, you just wanted to, you just kind of wonder like where, what the director is really trying to get you to. And, and, and sometimes I have no idea. I have no idea. I can contrive my own stuff. I can Mm -hmm. contrive, you know, what I think is going on. And, and I know sometimes you're saying you, you say a lot of times, like, you know, it doesn't matter what the artist was maybe trying to go to. Right. It's what you can contrive it to be. What, what you get out of it is more important than what the artist intended to, to get out of it. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's, and that's okay. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I know that I've looked at it and go, okay, I think I know, you know, I've read about what the director was maybe doing. And then I actually look at it and go, yeah, I don't see that. <laughs> and that's yeah. okay. You know, I did see, you know, when I, like I said, when I saw this, I saw him trying to, it was a way for him to gain empathy more where he didn't have any. Mm-hmm. And it was kind of his path of that. But what you guys brought up was, I have not, I never thought about that part. Okay. Truly is he the victor? Truly is he the winner? Well, I don't know. Cause you know, he gets to be a bug for at least three years or more. He gets to be a prawn. I don't think he didn't win in any way, shape or form in this movie. Right. You know, I yeah. think I felt like, I feel like the aliens won. I feel like the, the, the man, the, the prawn and his son won. Yeah. That, they would be the only winners in this. 
and I feel like they won with a lot of, you know, with a lot of effort, a lot of tragedy. I, I really, I really like their companionship, the way that they work together. You know, mm-hmm. I love the friendship that they did. They did come to, to, uh, you know, two species kind of coming together to, for a, a kind of a, a joint thing. I mean, kind of under the guise of, you know, Hey, I'm going to be fixed if I help you, but still they, I truly believe, you know, at the end they did become friends because, you know, Vickis kind of sac- was kind of sacrificing himself to protect his ship as he was going, you know, being lifted up. But uh, the the prawn was being lifted up to his ship. Well, the the mech scenes were badass, no matter what. Oh my goodness! You want to talk about awesome CGI? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Again, I didn't. We didn't even bring up the mech scenes. I got to be honest, I kind of forgot about the mech scenes when I watched this again. It'd been long enough that I'd forgotten about it. And, and I was a moment where the mech catches oh, the rocket. Oh, so good. It's so good. And I remember that when that happened, I remember it being in a lot of the promotional, yeah. you know, commercials and stuff. Yeah. Cuz it is amazing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Matter of fact, I good. got chills again watching this movie and it, cuz it's been at least 3 or 4 years since I've seen it. And when you get chills again from a certain scene, when you kind of know it's coming, but you don't, oh my goodness, yeah. that just tells you that's good. That's just good stuff right there, man. Very effective. Very effective. Oh my goodness. <laughs> One thing that I would really like, you know, kind of talking about like if there was a, uh, if they did do a sequel, I would like to learn more about their technology. I thought the technology was part of it really, really cool. And I love how intelligent they showed, you know, them so- coming off as... So this is this is just my my take on it, and I don't know how much there mm-hmm. is to back it up and all that jazz. I okay. actually think that these aliens were not the not the necessarily the creators of that ship or the tech. I think they were literally a workforce. Well, and they, they they do allude to that in the movie. Yeah, they they do allude to that, and, and I, I I go all in on that one and say like you know these are not the the aliens who built all this. They're not. I don't they're know, not the though. big thing. I, I got I'm a counterpoint. Yeah, go ahead. The mech had a lot of weapons on it, and it was shaped like a prawn's general body and moved like a prawn. I so mean, they they could why be would their a worker. Is it a workforce and like military force? Like they're they're the low cast members in a different, you know, with that much mil that much armor on it. Now look, true. There's also a good possibility that in the sense that the plot sets them up as just the workers. Someone was like, "Well, look at all these great weapons that only the prawn, you know, prawns can, DNA can actually activate, right?" Yeah, and then that's true. And then that's kind of, uh, you know, slammed in there. And then on top of that, it's like this whole mech, and I guess there's more than one and stuff like that. But like this whole mech is really outfitted with a lot of weapons. So it's not like you know, old school karate where like uh, you know, uh, farm implements are used <laughs> to covertly create uh, become weapons like that would have been an interesting like if you wanted to stick in the lane of their workers have all their weaponry be something that was used like you can actually see the uh the usage of it as a worker that was turned into a weapon you know after they land oh or that's interesting seen as a weapon after they land that would have been more interesting but having explicit weapons that have no obvious you know like this thing's got rock. It's got conventional rockets in it, <laughs> you know, with unconventional payloads. But still, they're conventional rockets, mm-hmm. and it's like, okay, uh, how much of just a worker class could they be with that much? You know, well, they had conventional rockets with weird payloads, but they also had that zappy laser gun <laughs> thingy that just like disintegrated people too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, okay, you can actually make a more interesting case that that what that could be like an their version of an arc welder. Mm. Um, oh. so like if you wanted to go that direction, I think you could, but you got to remove the rockets. Like what, how in the world are the rockets, you know, a, a, a worker, uh, you know, a utility thing. I, uh, I honestly, didn't I mean, you could, any of I, that. Could, I could think of a way I could think of a way, I'm sure you could. way out there. It's like, if, you know, if stuff, if stuff builds up on, you know, like the outside of the ship or something like that, and you need to get it off and your rockets were of a certain payload. And that's the easiest way to like, kind of blast you know kind of like, like barnacles the hole of a ship yeah like barnacles, <laughs> but still, barnacles. Doesn't make any... yeah space barnacle yeah the rockets for space barnacles so you could get there but i don't think it helps the movie to get there but at the same time it's like if you want them to be seen as workers there's too much tech that's cool it's badass and it might be a rule of cool situation but it does it does counter that that 
that one idea. And that one idea was presented as something that, you know, um, academia was like, well, we're, we think that it's, you know, they might be the worker class. I, I blah, think blah, blah, it's blah. a multi-level like, no idea. Yeah. I think it's a multi-level, uh, you know, society in my opinion. An MLM. Or, <laughs> you, multi, <laughs> multi-level. <laughs> multi-level. <alien> society. <laughs> yeah, the only ones that get a pilot, those are the black diamonds. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Well, I mean, that's kind of how society works anyway. So right. it's human and, society. So. And that's the way I was thinking about these guys Maybe. is is that they're they did have a working class, but you could tell it that this Christopher speciesist. Yeah. Right. He was a little different from the rest of them. He seemed to be looking for technology. They did talk about that they hadn't seen a any kind of a leader class for a long time. Right. Right. They did mention that, which I always thought that he was one of those, which is why he was so different from uh, many of the other ones, the the kind of the picture. Uh, this might just be Josh, but um, one of the things that I thought it's okay. that might have happened when he goes up. Did it ever cross your guys' mind that he says he'll be back w- within three years? But really, it's like a it's like an Independence Day style when he comes back. Of they're coming with an invasion force to take over the world because of what he saw, the cruelties that they were At doing the upon labs. his people in the labs. I think the film alludes to that. Yeah. Yeah. It alludes yeah. to uh, you should you know be worried whether or not he's coming back to screw everyone over. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's the thing. It kind of I went okay. We have this kind of like maybe he's an admiral, maybe he's a uh, something, and maybe certain people he might take you know pity on. But this guy might be coming back for blood after he saw what he saw in those labs, man. Because that was maybe. pretty brutal. I don't care who it is, man. That was that was Shh. war crimes yeah, yeah. type stuff. I, I didn't get the impression that that his personality was was put across as he wants revenge. Like I think he wants to save his people, but I don't. Yeah. I didn't get the idea that he wants revenge. Like it, it seemed more like they were playing it as extreme sadness about. It like felt he, like he, it, more that he was going to go get people to bring his people back. That's that's exactly. what it felt like to me. But right. but I just had I this thought cross my mind yeah. of oh he's actually going to come back for blood. Well, I mean, you know, I mean. (laughs) And now we have Independence Day, a better version of Independence Day resurgence. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. Like I said, I don't want them to tell that story unless they unless they figure out an angle that's really, you know, unique and new. And it's kind of hard to tell that story. So we've talked about this before, like we've mentioned even uh, in this podcast, it's like, what does make what does great sci fi usually come from? Right. And a coming back for revenge as an evasion army is kind of difficult to tell in that same sci-fi situation. District like the best you 10, could probably first do, blood part four. Yeah. The best you could do <laughs> is like war is hell or something right. like that. Like you, yeah. you're, you're not, you're not going to get like a real human story that's just kind of blown out into fantastical situations because of the sci-fi setting when you do that type of thing. And that's the thing I always worry about with this type of stuff. You, you get a great universe, you get a uh, compelling narrative and some interesting ideas. And you're like, Oh, I'd like to, you know, and, and I think mm-hmm. when, when artists decide to give the audience what they want, they're really setting themselves up for failure because I think the audience goes, we want to know what happens. Did he make it home? Does he come back? Does his people get rescued? What happens later? You know, does how did the you know the prawns integrate better with society, or do they integrate worse with the society? I want to see all this stuff, and it's like that's fine and all. I mean, you can satisfy people's curiosity, but I'm not sure that's like the most compelling stories of satisfying our curiosity. I think in sci-fi, it's holding up mirrors to society, and that's not the same thing. Uh, that's a good point. You know, I I think I would be disappointed if they just came back with a. You know, joking aside, with with a raw, just alien invasion um, scenario, um, I th- I think it would cheapen the entire world if they just did something like that. It, it wouldn't even it wouldn't align very well with the first movie if they did something like that. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> at all. Yeah, I mean, if you're gonna do that, switch. It'd be genres. cash grab. You know, do do an alien and aliens. You know, just come back with a totally different idea. But it's set in the same universe, All right? Just don't do uh, alien not, versus not predator. Not even a different Requiem. idea, but like, yeah, like not even different idea, but like, say, a different uh, stance, movie yeah. wise. Mm-hmm. You know, and then that's fine. 
you know, that's fine. It's not going to be, you know, like I said, I think I'd rather see a more compelling, different story set in the same universe. That would be interesting to me. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Something that would might would wrap into a similar situation of them coming back, but not necessarily uh, anything to do with maybe Vickers. Vickers would be in it somewhere, but he's not the main focus of the movie. Yeah. Yeah. Possibly uh, something along those lines. Yeah. I don't even care about them coming back. Like, okay, I think fair enough. I think there's some really interesting stories you could tell, you know, mirror holding stories. So you're thinking along the lines of something like a, uh, born, you know, the born movies where they had uh, Jeremy Renner and he was like in a different kind of, okay, that's not a, that is a horrible movie. because that movie <laughs> this, this no, not really great. No, that one was not I'm not crazy. saying the movie was, <laughs> oh, good. It wasn't. It was bad. What I'm saying is, is <laughs> they tried to in universe. God, I started up a nest of bees. No, here, don't man. even, I don't even like, we, we can't even, I, I think <laughs> so, going at. but they took <laughs> something that was, that was a same universe. And then they tried to adapt a similar universe thinking in a different direction. And it sucked, but still. <laughs> well, okay. Think about this way: like the, the the most popular way I can think of, like how it's been done previously, is think of uh, a Marvel Cinematic Universe, other movies set in the same universe that the other movies are in, but it doesn't tell the story of the other characters. Oh yeah, okay. That's the idea I think is more interesting mm-hmm. because it's like you know don't don't go back to. Uh, Vickers, don't go back to uh, Christopher Johnson. Don't don't go back to these characters that we've already seen their journey. You know, maybe go back three or four movies later, or do you know uh, a prawn cinematic universe movie? I don't know, <laughs> a prequel to them coming yeah. to Earth or some shit like that. Yeah, or afterwards, or just you know a team up movie. <laughs> but, oh no you know, way! Yeah, that would but be tell awesome. Us, but you could tell like like that'd be kind of cool, right? That like, would be cool. Uh, like you have District Nine is basically Iron Man One, right? <laughs> and then a, do a different story, like a totally different story with a totally different set of cast and and everything else about a different, you know, societal matter set in that universe. And I think you get, I think you get something really cool out of it. I mean, I think, I mean, Abrams tried to do this with the the uh, Cloverfield. I mean, he did. It, yeah, Cloverfield with the he kind of did it really haphazardly and um well half the movies know. weren't even actually supposed to be Cloverfield movies exactly. that's the problem. It, it was after the fact and and I don't think something like this you can do after the fact. Like the, the only reason the Marvel Cinematic Universe works is because they have so much deep stories already being told that they can pull from. Right? Even if they're telling their own stories, they're still pulling from a large uh mythos that stretches back decades. Um, and so because of that, they had, it was, I would say it's difficult to do. It was difficult to do for them, but it's a lot easier like to do that with that, with that kind of mythos behind you. If you have something like it's almost exclusively, you know, done in district nine, like the universe is just set up in district nine and here it is whole cloth. It doesn't really come from anything else. Uh, it's harder to, you know, walk into this and, and, you know, and figure out a, a, for lack of a better term, a cinematic universe, but that would be kind of interesting. It's like every six or seven years, you get a different district nine universe movie. I mean, it could fail, could absolutely flop because people just are like, this doesn't make any, I want to see what happens. You know, cause again, you give the audience what they want. They'll at least show up for the sequel. Well, it's kind of that idea. Uh, I mean, it kind of, it's not exactly the idea, but it, you just wonder if, if the, if the idea or if it'll draw to draw people in, it's kind of, I think of the new avatar movies, like it's been so long. Will it still draw people in, you know, with right. similar ideas, they do know the universe. They do know, even though this is a different move, different idea within that universe with similar and, characters. And if they bring back the same character, I'm not sure it works. I'm it, not sure it works. Yeah. Well, I mean, they are bringing back the same characters in mm-hmm. avatar movies, but I don't think it would work right in a, uh, work in this movie uh, universe you're right well it might not work in avatar i i have yet to see i i'm really interested yeah. if it will yeah since he's already basically got like what three prequels or three uh uh three uh, sequels already uh, planned and two I of mean, them are being it, shot at the same time it's not to say that you can't i mean obviously um blade runner 2049 you know kind of comes back into the same universe and tells 
a story connected to the original story. Yeah, but ex- except it's still f- almost anthology like because the yeah, connection yeah, is. is not I mean the connection's the story and it's important and it's all that, but it's it's not like that direct sequel feeling. Like it's still a very anthology anthological feeling. I guess. I'm not you think sure how little is. how little sure Harrison is. Ford is in it. No, I don't think it matters that Harrison Ford isn't in it that much. Because the No, I'm agreeing with you on that. I don't think it's I don't think he he has to be because of the way that the whole story was set up overall. I yeah, I don't think it's anth- I don't think it's an anthology because I don't think it's telling a different story with different characters. It's telling a, a it's having a new protagonist in the story, but the entire plot of the story is the child of the people from the original story. Right. So it's like, there's nothing there, you know, to kind of say, well, we're in the same universe, but we're telling a different story with different characters. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I agree. Again, I think that you can do it well, obviously. I mean, it does work. It's just, you know, I, I think it's more interesting when they, especially since the, I guess it depends on whether or not the star of District 9 is really the plot and the environment, uh, the world that's set up, the world building, or if it's the characters. Because I would say it's the world building. And so therefore I want more stories in that world, but I don't need stories from the characters because the characters themselves aren't really what I'm, isn't really what sticks with me, right? It's the plot. It's the, I mean, it's not the plot, it's the world, the world building. So like, and in something like, you know, Blade Runner, it really is the characters. I mean, the, the, the world building the world's is cool, really but, good. Yeah. Yeah. But it really is a character driven system, uh, or character driven story. And so therefore a sequel on that works because it's character driven probably. Mm-hmm. I don't know. And then like, I don't think district nine is really character driven. I think it's really world driven. Yeah. I would agree with that. I would agree. Uh, yeah, it would. It's harder. It, it's uh, you could go. You could probably find a way to say that it is a little bit character driven just because it's it's mostly focused on those same people. But I would agree that overall it's world. Um, well, because like who do, what would you rather know about that? About the world? Would you rather know more about the world of District nine? Are your questions there? Or are they really with? how the characters were feeling during the movie. No, clearly it's, I mean, even my questions that I've thrown out to you guys have been more about the world. Yeah. Like I I want to know more about their technology. I want to know about, I want to know more about like how that guy had the intelligence to scrap together that ship out of like local computer parts. And yeah. Why does this fluid that comes from their own technology, that's a distillation of the existing fluid from their technology, but makes more fluid, like, why would that even be a thing? Yeah, why like, is it their you know, fuel? Why are their weapons so... Why are their weapons uh, uh, DNA locked, like, to a species? Like, that's a weird thing. Like, why Why would you make a handgun that's, you know... Uh, Who are they preventing from locked. using it? Yeah, like that That itself in and Were of itself... Were they preventing enemies to... of maybe another alien culture from exactly. taking their own... Yes. You would only do that uh-huh. if there were other aliens that you come in contact with. Like that's the only reason you would do that because it's species locked, not, you know, DNA locked, not like, you know, only this person can shoot this, you know, weapon. Maybe so that, they're fighting the aliens from war of the world to have the three fingers as well. And that's why they had to lock it because they're so similar. Yeah. I don't know. I like, and again, you yeah. know, maybe they've run into Xeno, uh, or Xenomorphs. Or, yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, sure. A crossover. Wonderful. Sure. That'll that would be, be awesome. Very, that'll be a B movie for sure. I'm so there. Yeah. But yeah, I, I think, I think, I think the world is why we're, the world is why I like the movie. Uh, yeah, I, I honestly couldn't, fine. except for like, I would, you know, the only thing I would be curious about is what happens in three years, you know? Sure. Uh, sure. It'd be cool to know that, Hey, Vic has got to go home, but beyond that, I'm good. I'm, I really am. Yeah. And maybe it's the format too. Maybe if you gave me a comic or a, uh, an animated, you know, short film or something like that about, you know, to just kind of answer some of those questions, I'd be like, Oh, that's cool. You know, as a kind of a, but as like a full two hour movie, I'm not sure I'd be interested. Yeah. We pray that they didn't go JJ Abrams on us and, and have to make you go to the comic book to find out certain stories that were talked about in the movie. So uh, in principle, I don't, I don't really care about that. 
I don't care either. That's why I never read the comic books. What the film is. Well, I don't care that you're you surround your media, but it needs to be non-important questions. It needs to be other things. You know, if it's like integral to the movie and the movie doesn't make any sense because you didn't read the comic, that's a bit of a problem because we're adults and we don't have a hundred percent of free time that we can go and do these types of things. Exactly. Exactly. I'm just glad. Hopefully they didn't do that with this one, but if they did, eh, I understand. No, I, I, again, I don't really, I mean, like I said, for a movie, I'd rather have something different. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, guys, I think this has been a good conversation. My goodness. My goodness. It's, it's been great. John, how do you feel? <laughs> yeah, you've been a little I'm, quiet lately. I'm good. I'm, I'm good. Uh, All right. I figured you probably were be were good and stuff. I think this is I think this has been a, a fun conversation. I think this is one of a really interesting conversation about a movie like this. I was uh, when I picked it with for mine, even though it was your movie, John. I or uh, Crit. Mm-hmm. Um, wait, I didn't pick this one. What one did I pick? <laughs> no, you didn't pick up. I did pick this one. I picked the other one. I picked the Attica. Gosh, dang it! I'm forgetting. Yep. Okay. Well, when you when you decided to pick this one, this one has always been one that's interesting to me, and I'm I'm really happy that we we got to go on this one because it's this movie's always fascinated me. So. Yeah, yeah, same. Anyway, so let's uh, let's go to our ratings, guys. If you guys are ready, yeah, and stuff. Um, let's go. Uh, let's go. You crit first, and I'll go last. All right, I'll do twelve out of fifteen cat food highs. Mm. That stuff looked delicious too. Oh yeah. No, it didn't. Ugh, I gagged when I watched it. That one that looked like it had extra gravy. Ugh, anything with gravy is delicious, dude. <laughs> Still can't find stuff that you don't like. All right. <laughs> Noted. Noted, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just put that on the list of things to serve. Yep. Yep. <laughs> uh, John, my man, what's uh, what's your rating, dude? Uh, I'd watch it with my mom. I mean. I don't Would know. You? She'd re- I don't think it's a she'd lot like of it. cuss words and a lot of violence. And a I lot don't of think she'd like it, but human giblets. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think if I could get my mom to get past this, well, I mean, my mom did watch the, uh, the the American Sniper. Is it American Sniper? That's got a lot of swearing. The Sniper movie. <laughs> she did watch that movie. It has a lot of swearing in it. So if she can get past the swearing with that movie, I think she could get past swearing with this one. She might like it. I don't know. It's kind of back and forth with my mom. That's awesome that you'd, you'd at least try, John. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to give it a rating of 8 out of 10 fingernails being pulled off. Uh, you and fingernails did the same thing with Oculus. I know. It's awesome. It's just so yucky. <laughs> and I would buy this again. Matter of fact, it's or I would buy this. It's in my queue to buy, actually. Um, I've been wanting to buy it physical, but it's actually in my digital queue that if I can't find it physical very easily. So hmm. I'm surprised you learned, remembered that far back into Oculus. Oh, the fingernails. Oh, that still makes me like gag a little bit. Mm-hmm. Every time I think. <laughs> All right, guys, let's move on to the new topic, which is. Crit gave it to us last week, so in preparation for this week, which is um, short movies or short films, which constitutes, if I remember correctly, Crit, you said movies that are typically under one hour. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because those are the rules I did follow. I went back and listened to our recording last week, and that's what you said, and I followed the guidelines as much as possible. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to lawyer you on it, but yeah. I know you're not. I wanted to, I, I did it more to just like see what my, what I was looking for. Cause I was a little yeah. bit, I was not sure when you gave it to me last week, I kind of like, you know, went, uh, you know, kind of sucked there a little bit. <laughs> Cause you don't Cause, have many short films on your, no, movies, most of yeah. the time you guys give topics. And I'm like, Oh, I know what I want to do right now. Right. Or at least one of them. I couldn't have named one. Matter of, oh. Yeah. I, <laughs> let's just say I, uh, I, thought about this a lot and still struggled so anyways all right my pop filter got punched again all right <laughs> i keep hitting it it's really close to me um i need to adjust it so i can't hit it as much as i was this time all right guys let's get into my picks all right 
Um, number one, this is a favorite action when royalty is present. Number okay. two, this person is a hero in her community. Number three, it's nice to see these by your side on the beach. I like number one, probably the best, because I don't want to hear about heroes. I'm in the dystopian utopian mood, so I'm all Still? For dark, <laughs> okay. dark, and so I don't want. No, I don't want number two. Could be least. dark, like That's if there's true. like two sharks next to you on the beach. That's true. Of course, if they're on the beach, I I could do dangerous. one or three. I don't want to do two. Okay, no well, heroes. Let's go with number one then. Number two is. This person is a hero in her community. It's called Heroin, and it's about a lady uh, f- fighting heroin in her community uh, that's being flooded with oxycotton and heroin. So that that was one. Uh, number two, or number three, which you didn't pick, was It's Nice to See These By Your Side on the Beach. It was a, a short film called Footsteps. Okay. And it was a movie about, or a short film about a... Um, Oh my goodness, the name just went out of head. The people, the grips, uh, audio grips. The okay. people who are making uh, noises on, on film for you. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. That actually would have been decent. Dang it. Number one is Bow. <laughs> when you said it was Pixar movie, I went, huh. <laughs> oh, no. This is the Pixar short movie Bow. Yeah. B A O for our B A O. That's why yeah. it's uh, something that's favored by royalty when they're present. Bow. So we'll probably have Ross on next week then. <laughs> why? Because <laughs> he loves Disney Pixar. Oh, okay. Fair enough. So if you guys have a hard time finding this one out on the open internet, it is it is on the beginning DVD of uh, The Incredibles 2. Okay. And stuff. So I was hoping you would pick. Honestly, two or three, or sorry, one or three is one which the ones I picked. More leaning the three. I thought that grip one would have been pretty cool, but I think I've seen the bow one, and I thought it was I thought it was very interesting. So hopefully you guys um, think it's very interesting as well. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it, Crit, but I'm pretty sure John. Uh, I don't has. know. I don't know. It's kind of a weird, interesting uh, cartoon for a yeah, picture. Well, don't don't do anything on it because it's only two minutes long. So we kind of. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we need everything we get for next week. Right, right. So That's yeah, true. I was a little hesitant on it because of the length, but I it's thought okay. it was a good one. That's... Still, nevertheless, it has a lot of conversation points. Yeah, it, it's okay. that's the whole point, right? So, anyways, um, yeah. Uh, thanks for being on the podcast, guys. I enjoyed this conversation very much, Thank and uh, I hope you en- enjoy your two minute and thirty second uh, movie this week. Give you a little bit of a um a little bit of a um hiatus from <laughs> from from watching really long movies or we could you know watch the movies for our i was our just going to suggest that also this yeah. might give us time to come up with the movies that um uh that we didn't need to do in our catch up which uh maybe we could do that um on the next one instead of i know we need to um anyways I'll, we'll talk after the podcast but um and get up get to our finally our catch up movie <laughs> movies finally anyways everybody thanks for being on and to everybody out there listening thank you for supporting our channel um please click like button if you like what you heard here uh it really helps us with our youtube algorithm and um makes us be shown to other other channels and other people and as always may you be excellent to each other and live long and prosper from josh's from all of us here at josh's house of nerd good night Thanks for watching. For more nerdy awesomeness, please like and subscribe and check 